Yeah, I want to let you know, um, second service people, we do have an, a service at 9 o'clock and at 1140, so <laughs> if you find yourself standing or sitting on the floor one week, we'd love to have you at another service. We did, our, our team just did order uh, like a bunch more chairs to cram in this room this week, so we do have more uh, coming. Um, I am still uh, reeling from last weekend. Um, last weekend was a really big weekend for my family for several reasons. One that you don't know about is uh, last Friday, like a week and a half ago, my um, sister's adoption was finalized. We've been waiting for her to be able to finalize an adoption for about four or five years. It's felt like 10. And she signed the papers on Friday, and it was totally amazing. Then um, last Sunday was great because we celebrated Mosaic's fifth anniversary, and we had cupcakes. Uh, Kyle threw down, and it was awesome. And we had an all-time record attendance, which was really cool. And then uh, a bunch of you know that last Sunday afternoon, they tricked my wife and I to come back to this building, and we didn't know why. And they shoved us out on stage, and there's like 150 of you guys in here who yelled surprise and started cheering for us and threw like a surprise thank you party for us for uh, Start Mosaic five years ago. And we really appreciate that. Um, Your generosity left us speechless. Uh, But all of that makes me really excited to launch this series we're doing today, starting today, called We Are Mosaic. Now, to kind of introduce where we're going, uh, let me talk about breakfast. I love breakfast, most important meal of the day. You should eat breakfast every day. We all know that, right? I also love eating out for breakfast. There's just something about not having to full of cooking anything, get something on the way to work, get your Dunkin' Donuts coffee, get the day started. But I came across um, an ingredients list for a certain breakfast item recently. And what I want to do is I want to read you this list of ingredients. I'm going to read you just about all of them. And I want to see if you can figure it out. Okay, so here's, here's the ingredients for this popular breakfast item. Uh, food starch modified, natural flavor from plant source, barley malt extract, caramel color, a preservative called sulfur dioxide, which I thought sulfur like killed you or something, but sodium phosphate, datum, sodium steroil lactylate, sodium citrate, and carrageenan. So if you know, if, I mean, if that's in your favorite breakfast, just turn to your neighbor and tell, tell them if you know what it is. Okay, anybody? Nobody? Here's a hint. Here's a hint. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba! It's McDonald's oatmeal. Right! Now, when I cook oatmeal, there are two ingredients. There is water, and there is oatmeal. And I may put some cinnamon and sugar on top of it, like maybe four ingredients. But when you get McDonald's oatmeal, there are 21 different ingredients in McDonald's oatmeal, most of which you've never heard of and were cooked up in some kind of laboratory. In fact, the state of Vermont actually sued McDonald's because Vermont makes maple syrup or something, and McDonald's uh, sold this oatmeal called fruit and maple oatmeal, and it didn't have any real maple syrup in it, so they were sued for it. Now, that's kind of disgusting to think of these weird ingredients that may be in your food, but I can see what you guys are thinking. Carl, I don't care if it tastes good. If it tastes good, just put it in my body. I'm good. And I'm kind of with you because I ate a hot dog last week, and I don't want to know what's in that hot dog. I don't need to know how it's made. Just don't ever tell me. All I know is when I put mustard and chili and cheese on top of it, it was good. I'll take another. Thank you very much. But at Mosaic, we're not going to have 21 different ingredients. What we are going to do is for six weeks, I want to tell you what I think are the six ingredients that make Mosaic unique. And it's not our system or our strategy. Our strategy is our three C's, celebrate, connect, contribute. It's not our vision. Our vision is to be a church for people who don't go to church. But these six things make Mosaic unique. I think they're why you like Mosaic and, more importantly, why your life has changed here. Today we're kicking off this series with a message called, We Are All About Jesus. Now I know that sounds pretty obvious. Oh wow, a church that's all about Jesus. Shocking. But the truth is a lot of churches are not about Jesus. I've seen churches become more passionate about social issues than Jesus, or they become passionate about part of what Jesus says. So yeah, let's do the serve the poor thing, but when Jesus talks about sexuality, let's just ignore all that. I've seen even some churches become more passionate about the church than they are about Jesus. Like the church is supposed to be a means to the end of Jesus, but they treat the church as the end goal. This was a temptation I faced the first couple years of Mosaic. We, when we launched, had less than 100 people come in regularly. And so when you have less than 100 people, if somebody gets mad and leaves, you know it. And if somebody stops serving or stops giving, you feel that. So if I ever talked about hell is real or Satan exists or you need to stop the sexual sin you're involved in, I get really nervous. 
And it wasn't nervous like, I have the power of life that I get to tell people about and I'm nervous they won't accept it. No, it was nervous like, I hope nobody gets upset or offended. I hope no one leaves. So I wouldn't talk about controversial things as much because I mistakenly thought my goal as the lead pastor was to build a church. That's not my goal. My goal is to talk about Jesus. Now, see, there's problems with preaching about Jesus. One is that it's divisive. At Mosaic, we believe all religions are not equal. They cannot offer equal hope. In a few minutes, I'll explain why. Another problem with Jesus, uh, with preaching Jesus, no problems, Jesus. Another problem with preaching Jesus (laughs) is that, this sermon just went a different direction is that it's not what you want to hear sometimes. So you come in here and you want something that'll help your anger problem or, or fix your marriage, but you don't want to necessarily be confronted that you're, you have sin you need to repent of. And people will leave when we talk about Jesus. Ironically, the number one most important thing here is also the number one thing that keeps us from growing more quickly. I looked at the number this week, and this year... We are going to have over, first time ever, we're going to have over 1,000 first-time visitors visit Mosaic this calendar year. We're going to give 1,000 of those T-shirts away in the lobby. And that's great. And some of those people won't come back to Mosaic because we're not their style. And that's, that's fine. There's churches that are other styles. That's, that's all good. Um, but a lot of the people who won't come back, uh, uh, most of the people who come here and don't stick around, leave because they're offended by Jesus. And some of you in this room one day will leave because you're offended, because you don't want to change your sex life or how you handle money or you don't want to invest in others relationally and you'll reach a crossroads. You'll have a a fork in the road really where you realize if I'm not going to do what Jesus says, then what's the point of me even going? Now, I'm not going to tell you to leave. I want you to stay here as long as it takes to figure out. This is a safe place for that. We want to give you as much time as you need. But make no mistake, We are blatantly asking you to choose between living for yourself and living for Jesus. Mosaic is all about Jesus. And so what I want to do for the next few minutes is I have uh, have some scriptures from a letter uh, that Paul wrote to a church in the city of Colossae. And I'm going to take just a section of that and just point out three different reasons that Mosaic is all about Jesus. And what I want you to do, I want you to get the program they handed when you, when you came in. I'll wait. Go ahead. Get out the program you got when you came in. And get out that pen from the seat pocket in front of you. I want you to write these three things down. I think these are important. I'd love for you to take these home and put them someplace where you can stare at them this week. The first reason we are all about Jesus is Jesus is the one who changes me. Here's what Colossians 1.6 says. In this letter says, the same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. Jesus is the one who can change you. Every other religion teaches, get your act together, do these things, say these things, think these things. The message of Christianity is unique in the world because it and it alone teaches you can't change. You have a nature that's selfish, and you need help beyond yourself. In fact, any change you can make is a superficial change, but Jesus wants to go deeper. You can change your body. You can change your thought process. You can change how you handle money, but only Jesus can change your heart. And the reason we talk about some issues sometimes that seem kind of surface, like we'll talk about parenting or marriage or or how to deal with your job, is because Jesus wants to enter into your life. And he doesn't want to just give you some practical advice on those things. He wants to fundamentally change your worldview, and that will result in different fruit in those areas. See, there's a lot of different ways you can try to change. I was reading an article recently about some technology that is designed to help us change, and it had about 10 different products. One of them was something called the Happy Fork, and it's based on the premise that sounded true because it was on the internet, uh, um, that it wants you to eat slower because it takes a while after your stomach is full for your brain to realize that your stomach is full. So if you eat fast, you will have a tendency to overeat. Um, that's what the article said, so just go with it. And, but they, these people designed something called the happy fork. And what it is, is it's a fork you eat with, and it has something in it that like uh, senses how fast your fork is going from your plate to your mouth. And it will like vibrate and shake and make it hard for you to eat 
if you go too fast, which I thought, okay, well, I'll just stab the whole steak and just eat it in one bite then, and it won't sense me going back and forth. I also saw a website called Beeminder that is a reminder site where um, you set goals for yourself. And so, for example, uh, you set goals that um, can be integrated with other forms of technology. So if you say you want to run, it'll integrate with your phone while you go run. Or if you say maybe you want your email inbox to get to empty, it, you have to sync up your email with it, but it will keep you accountable for these goals. And the first time that you fail to achieve a goal, it will just send you an email. But what you're supposed to do apparently is after that, you enter in your credit card information and you choose a dollar amount. So the next time that you don't reach that goal, it just charges you a certain amount of the, your credit card that pays the company. So it literally costs you to not change your life. So you can roll with that if you want. The Bible teaches, however, that when you give your life to Christ by repenting and being baptized, that the spirit of Christ, the, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, comes and lives inside you. And then that power changes you. And so what we say at Mosaic is if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, then come to Jesus. If, you're mar if you have a marriage that is hopeless, give your life to Christ and let him teach you forgiveness. If you have debt collectors who harass you daily, give your life to Jesus and let him teach you how to handle your finances with wisdom. If you have an addiction that you enjoy because it's a daily escape, give your life to Jesus and let him give you a purpose from which you don't need to escape. See, Colossians goes on to say this about change. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. Now, what's he talking about? The Bible says elsewhere that the fruit of God's spirit living inside you is peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Don't you want some of those things in your life? If you can't change, Jesus is what you need. He's the one who'll change you. Second thing I want you to write down is Jesus will give me hope. Jesus is the one who gives me hope. Colossians 1 verse 4. For we have heard, Paul's saying this to these people, we've heard of your faith in Christ and your love for all God's people, which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You've had this expectation ever since you first heard the, good the truth of the good news. Now there's this um, trend in American Christianity that I don't like. Uh, it's a trend to downplay the hope that Christians have in heaven. And people say uh, Christians in the past have gotten so focused on heaven that they haven't done any good here in our world. And I would disagree with that. I like what C.S. Lewis said. He said, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. I believe the people who downplay the hope we have in heaven haven't experienced deep pain because the Bible describes heaven as the place where all is made right, where justice rules, where there's no more tears or crying or pain for the old order of things has gone away. When you attend the funeral of a child, you realize there better be a greater hope in the life to come. The problem is a lot of people are missing that hope. In May, the New York Times published an article about suicide and how it's increasing in frequency in our nation. From 1999 to 2010, the rate of suicide went up 30% in our country. Now, 3,000 more people die every single year from suicide than die from car accidents. In fact, the uh, suicide rate for middle-aged men is three times higher than that of middle-aged women. And one of the researchers in the project from Rutgers said people had great expectations for what their life would look like but it hasn't turned out that way. Where do you go when you need hope? I mean, real hope, not like when your team loses and you're in a bad mood, but when your child gets diagnosed with a disability. When your parents who've been married 40 years say, we're getting divorced. When she says, I just don't love you anymore. When he says, there's someone else 
When your sibling says, can we just keep our distance? Where do you go for hope? In the 19th century, there was a Japanese haiku poet known as Isa. It's the first time I've ever quoted a haiku poet. Isa experienced many tragedies in his life. It started when he was young and his mother died, and it culminated when he was a father and his young daughter passed away. Amidst his grief, he went to visit a Zen master expert for comfort and for wisdom, and the Zen uh, the master reminded Issa what Zen Buddhism teaches, that the world is an illusion. Like the morning dew, our lives will evaporate with the rising sun. And that's how a lot of us in here treat life. This is all there is. Let's just eat, drink, and be merry. That This is our world. This is our life. And although Issa remained committed to his Buddhist worldview, something in him longed for a more hopeful existence. When he returned home, he wrote these words. The world is due... The world is due, and yet, and yet. See, Isa, the Orthodox Zen believer, must say that life is only due, but Isa, the father, the husband, the son, the human being, with his agonized grief and tortured love, looks into the unfulfilled darkness where Zen sheds no light and cries out, and yet, he feels the inescapable tension between the logic of what he believes and the experience of who he is. And some of you know exactly what he's talking about. Because you claim to be agnostic or you claim to be atheist, you think all things spiritual or intellectually beneath you, but when you experience pain, real pain, where do you go? You say the world is due, but your gut says, and yet, and yet, Mosaic is all about Jesus, because Jesus is the only one who will give you hope. If you came in here this morning and you're already following Jesus, and you're hurting we just cling to him because he'll give you hope. Last thing I want you to write down. Jesus is the one who saves me for eternity. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus rose again, but he's coming back for those who are his. Here's what verse 23 says. It talks about being faithful. You must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. See, too often we have a bad picture of Jesus, a lesser picture of Jesus. We picture him as a pansy who drives a Prius and picks flowers and eats hummus and talks about love all the time. And if you drive a Prius, don't send me an email. I'm not bashing you. But see, here's the problem. Let me just tell a story to explain it. There used to be these conferences. Maybe they're even still around. I don't know. Um, I know they were real popular in the 90s called Promise Keepers. And it was uh, for men only. And what they would do is this conference would rent out an entire arena, like an NBA arena, and they would have 20,000 men or something come from around and go for like a pump-up weekend about loving Jesus and, and loving your family and that type of thing. And, and it was, I'd heard a lot about it. Uh, it was a successful, you know, deal. And so when I worked at another church before coming to Mosaic, our church got together this big busload of guys that was going to drive to North Carolina and go to one of these conferences. And I was kind of excited because I'd heard good things. There was about 60 of us. I was really excited, though, because on our bus in our group were 10, maybe 12 guys who were not believers. They did not follow Jesus. They said they did not want to follow Jesus. They wanted to hang out with the guys. They were kind of open to hearing about Jesus, but they were nowhere close, they said, to giving their lives to him. And so I was really excited because I thought, man, a conference environment, you know, around thousands of other men, I think this will be a great environment for these guys to get motivated to give their lives to Christ. So we go, uh, get to North Carolina, go in the arena, and we're sitting in the upper deck of, of one side of the arena, and across from us, on the other side of the arena, it's about 10 minutes before the event's going to start, are uh, maybe 60, 100 people from one church. And I could tell they were from one church because they all had matching t-shirts like they were on a sixth grade field trip in Washington, D.C. <laughs> they proceeded to all stand up together, and in unison, chant, point at us across the arena and chant, we love Jesus, yes we do, we love Jesus, how about you? 
And I sat there in complete shock while people all around me started standing up and chaining back with great enthusiasm, we love Jesus, yes we do, we love Jesus, how about you? And this thing goes on for like five, 10 minutes until the event starts and when it finally ends, they all laugh and clap like, oh man, this is just a great start to the conference. Meanwhile, I am sitting there horrified because next to me, I have these non-believers who are gripping their chairs as tightly as they can and looking for how they can make the quickest escape because they're thinking, this is why I'm not a Christian, because you have to be a pansy who does middle school cheerleader yells if you want to follow Christ. No thanks. See you later. Christians have sold Jesus short. Fortunately, the Bible gives a much better, cooler description of Jesus. Look at how Revelation 19 describes Jesus when he comes back at the end of time. This is awesome. The writer says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider, Jesus, is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire. On his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. His name's the word of God. The armies of heaven were following behind him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of Jesus' mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When Jesus returns... He is not going to put his arms around us and say, can't we all just get along? God is not the man upstairs, the big guy in the sky. Jesus is not your homeboy, and we do not pray to six-pound, eight-ounce baby Jesus. Jesus is the soon-returning, conquering King of kings and Lord of lords. Look at the scripture. He's riding a white horse. His eyes are on fire. His robe has blood in it. He's got a sword coming out of his mouth. He's tatted up on his thigh with his name, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is MMA fighting, world conquering, everyone judging Jesus. The reason you must recognize this is this Jesus is the only one who can save you. And when we meet Jesus, we will not say, I love Jesus, how about you? We will bow down to the one who created the universe, died on a cross, rose from the grave, will judge the earth. He is our King, Redeemer, Savior, and Lord. And that's what we're about here. And you should clap if you want to, because I get pretty excited about that. So at Mosaic, we will keep Jesus central. And very quickly, I just want to give you three ways we're going to do that. One way is we're going to keep Jesus central by focusing on the Bible. Your understanding of who Jesus is must come from the Bible. Everything I just taught you comes from the Bible. It doesn't matter who you think Jesus is. It doesn't matter who you feel Jesus is. It matters what the Bible says Jesus is. Every day, you should read at least one verse in the Bible. And that you should not compromise on that. At Mosaic, a second way we will keep Jesus central to everything we do is we will present the gospel every week. This is one of the reasons, maybe really the main reason, we celebrate communion every week. Because we talk about a lot of different things in here. It could be, you know, parenting or sex or, or your job or something. But celebrating communion focuses us, it forces us to remind ourselves Jesus is the Son of God who lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and will set us free. So whether we're talking about how to get out of debt or how to date, we're going to talk about Jesus. Now, what is the gospel, you may ask? Well, it's kind of everything I've been talking about this morning. I'll spell it out very clearly. You are a sinner. Your entire life, you have chosen to rebel against what you knew was right and do what was best for yourself. Even the good deeds you do are done with selfish motives to make yourself feel better. This separates you from God. God is holy. He is sinless. So when you choose to rebel, you say, God, I'm walking away from you. Even if you didn't realize the full ramifications of, of it at the time, that's what you were doing. Jesus is fully God and fully human. He lived a perfect life, so he didn't have to suffer for sin. Yet, he chose to take your place of suffering and separation from God. He did this by dying on the cross. But then Jesus rose from the grave. 
He proved he could defeat death, even the greatest enemy, and that his words could be trusted. Then he ascended to heaven, from where he will one day return to judge the living and the dead. And now, if you will trust him, eternal life is available to you. It doesn't matter what pain you've experienced or how hopeless your situation is, you can have life. Let me show you one more passage from Colossians that sums up a lot what we've been talking about. Colossians 1.19. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through Christ, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you. You who are once far away from God. You are his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions, Yet now, he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Man, if you don't have that, don't you want that? Mosaic will also be all about Jesus by pursuing lost people. If you don't follow Jesus... At Mosaic, we believe you are lost. And we don't say that as an insult to you because we have all been there. We say that as hope for you that you can be found. Our appeal to you is this. Give your life to Christ. Let him change you. Let him give you hope. Let him give you eternal life. Acts twenty two sixteen 16 says, And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. Next service, we're baptizing somebody who came up to me an hour ago in the lobby and said, I'm ready, I need to do it. What about you? Jesus is the one who can change you. Jesus is the one who can give you hope. Jesus is the one who will give you life forever. And mosaics can be all about Jesus. Last week, I was floored by the thanks and generosity of this church. And I had a realization about mosaic. My parents are in town this weekend. They're, they're great parents, uh, did a fantastic job. But one thing they've always said that's, that's kind of puzzled me, um, they, they said when we, me and my siblings have become adults, is they said one thing that makes them so proud is all four of their kids, they feel like, have exceeded their dreams for their kids. They've exceeded what my parents think they could have set us up for, each in our own way. And I've always thought that was a little awkward, but uh, last Sunday, that's the feeling I had towards Mosaic because um, so many of you were so generous in pouring out your generosity and thanks to my wife and I, I went home and I thought, you know, I'm a good teacher, but I ain't that good. <laughs> and what I realized, it, it was a very fulfilling feeling because I realized I didn't teach people that. And so the only thing that must be true is they're not following Carl, they're following Christ. And it was very fulfilling. Let me kind of explain it a different way. I want to do something in here that I don't think I've done on a Sunday before. Um, I want you to think for a minute, uh, for a second, of what, what religion you were before you came to Mosaic. Uh, you know, what did you come from? Maybe for some of you it was a different denomination, so maybe Baptist or, or Catholic. Some of you, maybe it was Zen Buddhist, maybe agnostic. One person said, is there a religion called partying? Because that's what I was. My religion was partying. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. If that's what your religion was, then say that. Think of that. Well, what I, what I want is for you to think of whatever your religion was, and on the count of three, kind of loud, we've got a lot of people in here, kind of loud, I want you to say out loud uh, whatever that is, okay? Here we go. One, two, three. Okay, a little more energy. One, two, three. Yeah, be proud of your broken past. Uh, here's, what I want, here's what I want you to do instead here. Now, on the count of three, say Jesus. One, two, three. Jesus. Okay, now a little bit softer. One, two, three. Now, just a whisper. One, two, three. That's what we're about here. But see, here's the thing. Today's message isn't really at all about Mosaic. Because Mosaic is going to be about Jesus. We're going to have peace and fulfillment and purpose. We're going to see lives change. We've been seeing it for five years. We're going to keep seeing it. Mosaic is about Jesus. Today's message is about you. Are you going to be all about Jesus? Is your life going to be consumed by receiving wisdom, comfort, direction, and eternal life from the one who died to set you free? 
And if you want those things, then Mosaic is a place you should call home because Mosaic is going to be all about Jesus. Let me pray to wrap us up. Jesus, we want you to know that you are our hope. We repent for thinking Mosaic could be built on anything else. We repent for thinking our lives could be built on anything else. We repent for not pursuing you daily in the Bible. That's going to change. Jesus, we want you to know that this church is built solely on you. This church is not about a strategy or a person or a building or anything else than the saving power of Jesus Christ. Jesus, we want you to know we are going to carry your message to other people. We're going to hold.